So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tom Tawilliger, the final speaker of the day. So Tom is a, a founder member of the Diffraction Data Deposition Working Group. Uh, he was the agreed nominee of the uh, Commission on Biological Macromolecules of the IUCR, and I believe is now its chairman. Um, he's also the incoming president um, of the ACA, and uh, I think you will uh, agree with me with the uh, vision for realizing the living PDB and how raw diffraction data and its metadata can help. Tom has his finger on all the pulses. Thanks, John. Yes, it's a delight to be here and to talk to you about this. You know, this talk is on continuous improvement of data, of interpretation of data in the protein data bank. And actually, when I started off pushing this idea, there was a lot of resistance that this just didn't seem like a practical thing, and there's all these challenges to doing it. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, I was at a workshop of the, that the Protein Data Bank organized. It was on a validation of uh, ligand structures, in fact. And this issue came up, and it was, it was obvious that, of course, we should do this. It was like, wow, uh, this is really catching on. So uh, maybe I'm just going to be preaching to the choir here for the next minutes, which would be the easier thing to do than usual. So this, this talk is basically coming from a paper that Gerard Bracconi and I uh, published last year. There was a, a series of, of, of papers that were published based on the uh, diffraction data uh, deposition working group, um, and this, is, this was just one of those. And uh, so let me give you a, a little background here. The idea of reanalysis of uh, deposited data um, goes back a long ways, and here's um, one quotation from uh, Harrod Klavek and uh, Alan Jones group, uh, after they, uh, they, they developed a server, the, the uh, electron density server, there's basically a tool to allow anybody, and it's, it's there today, it allows anybody to look at the electron density for any structure in the PDB for which uh, uh, structure factors have been deposited. Uh, so basically, looking at those maps um, allows you, the user, to evaluate with your own eyes, as we heard earlier today, whether or not a structure is likely uh, to be right, or whether, whether or not a particular feature of that structure is right. And you don't have to own any fancy tools in order to do this. You just go to the web, um, and you can um, uh, look right there, or you can download the files and look at them on, on your own computer. So this is a very nice tool. And they came up with the idea that, yes, perhaps this whole structure database should be dynamic, not just a fixed here's a structure, um, take it or leave it, but maybe we should be updating these as things go on. Um, more recently, um, Robbie Justin, uh, Braconia, and Gert Vreed, and others um, developed a, a pipeline that they call PDB Redo that um, was alluded to earlier today also, in which the structures in the PDB for which data are available, uh, structural factors are available, are continuously re-refined and actually remodeled at a certain level um, as well. So you can go to the PDB Redo site and you can download um, a version of any structure that's in the PDB um, that is basically the best automated structure you could get um, using the tools that they're using um, uh, that starts off with the structures in the PDB. And many of these are demonstrably uh, less inaccurate than the structures that were originally in the PDB. So there's already significant merit to going to that site to get your structure rather than one from the PDB. Um, I wouldn't necessarily take everyone from there yet, but certainly the direction is, is, is the right one. And um, they made some arguments why this is a good idea. Um, and amongst them, uh, the last one there, it's good for the depositors. So this is kind of one of the worries, like, well, I deposit my structure, that's my great, wonderful structure, how can anybody ruin it? But in fact, these guys are going to make your structure even better, and you still get credit for it, so what's wrong with that? And so, lots of ideas to do that. So, why are we even talking about this? It's, it's obvious, right? I already told you people are feeling it's obvious. Um, it's because the current paradigm is not what I just described. So, the protein data bank is and for the foreseeable future, re will remain the definitive repository of macromolecular structures. It's really unique um, in, in the structure of biology, in the, the biology world, that there's really only one place. This is the place where if you want to get a structure, it's, it's going to be there. And the crystallographic community sees uh, the PDB as, as its archive of models um, and data. And the biological community, which is much, much bigger, 
uses the PDB as its essentially only entry uh, into structures. They want a structure, that's where they're going to get them. And other it's very important to recognize that other repositories like PDB Redo would have to add major, major value to these structures uh, to be widely viewed. And they're not widely viewed. Anything like the PDB um, is at the moment. So that's an important issue is that the protein data bank is totally special. Now, how does it work in terms of structure determination and analysis? Well, right now it's really one time thing. Uh, a crystallographer or their team determines a structure. Um, they deposit the data now that goes with that structure and their model, which is their interpretation of the data. Um, and that's basically it. And it is possible to update these structures. Um, it's easier for the depositor to update the structure than for anybody else. Um, basically, the original depositor can uh, remove the original and replace it with another uh, deposit. Um, and then that becomes the definitive new uh, structure. Um, anybody else can uh, reanalyze and deposit another version of that structure, uh, but doing so requires um, a, uh, a, a publication to go with it, um, and B, it's a lot of work, and C, the new structure is, for all intents and purposes, not associated with the old structure. It gets a new PDB identifier. Of course, there will be a link that says um, that this is highly related to a previous one, but there's no link that says this is the exact same data except in text. So it's basically like a new structure. It's, it's poorly linked. That's today's version. This will all be changing. The PDB also is on board that it's obvious this has to change. This is all very good. Now, another important aspect of this is the historical focus has been on the model, on the interpretation, not on the data itself. So you deposit a PDB structure. It's the structure, it's the coordinates that are the thing that everybody thinks about. It's the coordinates that originally got the identifier. And then later as an afterthought, with a lot of work, um, the structure factors started getting deposited along with that. Okay, great, that's, but it's an, those are like an annotation of the model rather than the other way around which you would imagine is, makes much more sense. And there's only rare reference to the data itself. It's really the reference to the structure, the coordinates. And the community, the biological community, doesn't see the data at all. So why should this be different? Why, why doesn't this make sense, the, the current state? Well, to me, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, and one is the reinterpretation idea is totally feasible. So PDB redo has demonstrated that you can automatically reanalyze structures at a high, at a high level um, and, and with high throughput. So it's, it's feasible to do that automatically, even though it's not perfect yet. But surely that'll get better. And as software improves, that capability will be extended. Second, uh, third, uh, validation procedures exist uh, to evaluate model quality. I'll mention this later. And the protein data bank itself is spending a lot of effort on developing standards for validation uh, of protein structures and of the data. And um, importantly for this, this meaning, um, the availability of raw images will extend the capability of reinterpretation um, even further. So, An expert reanalyzing uh, images can often obtain data that are far superior um, to the, the data that are, the uh, process data that are obtained by routine application of even their own tools. And just an example of that, um, recently I was working on uh, methods for solving structures by uh, sulfur SAD, and we had a structure, some structures that were cha very challenging to solve. We obtained the data from the original. Uh, depositors, and we tried to solve that. And we could solve some of them, but uh, uh, only with great difficulty by merging together. Um, and then we sent the same data, or uh, the same data went to uh, Spisak Ochanowski, who is Vladek's companion, uh, who works on uh, the data processing, and Spisak reanalyzed all that data. Um, and then suddenly, a lot of these structures could be solved that basically couldn't be solved before. So an expert, but not super expert, is not the same as, as a super expert, right? So, and, and these processes will always be getting better, right? So it is surely true that down the road, we will be able to take the exact same images and obtain much better, more accurate structure factors and therefore more accurate phases and we'll get better models. 
Um, and this, you know, might say it doesn't really matter, you only can change small things, but actually at lower resolution, a little bit of difference can make a huge you know, impact. And so our structures may well be dramatically improved by doing this. Okay. And uh, reinterpretation is, is a good thing to happen. It's not only feasible, um, but what, why would we do this? Uh, well, you can fix minor errors. Um, many people, including some in the room, Vladek has published papers particularly on uh, validation of metal ions, <laughs> for example, um, in, in structures. Others here have also published structures about errors in structures. Surely we can fix the, fix the little things. And um, maybe we'll fix the big, big things as well. So why leave these errors in there if we know how to fix them? Another thing is you might be able to get consistency amongst uh, related structures uh, by using consistent methods. So just imagine a situation where you're solving the structures of a whole bunch of, stru of proteins that are more or less the same with different ligands or something like that. And what you're really interested in is the differences between these. Well, if you use a different software package for each one, um, and you allow the side chains to refine to different conformations in each one, um, you get a whole bunch of differences that are totally superfluous, that are irrelevant. But if you did everything totally consistently and refined all, all those structures together and only allowed differences amongst them that are required by the data, surely you would get more accurate differences that way. So that kind of thing is the kind of thing you might imagine people doing in a systematic way if you are basically allowed to reinterpret all these structures. Of course, you can do that today, but you can't make it available to everybody in an easy way. Um, you might have new formulations about how you even describe structures, multi-model descriptions of structures, um, and uh, yeah, the other ones I really talked about, joint refinement of structures. Okay, so why hasn't this happened already a long time ago? So it's a really a cultural thing. And um, the interpretation of a structure is basically owned by the person who solved it. So I solved my structure, um, I spent a whole lot of effort at getting it there, I deposited it in the PDB, and then everybody in the world knows that's Tom's structure. And then if, if there's something wrong with it, it's my fault and everything, um, but basically somebody else just goes and takes my data and reinterprets that, um, there might be conflict between me and them. And that's, we don't want that, right? And that's a, just a cultural thing. There's no reason why that should be that way. And but why is it? It's because, you know, I spent a lot of effort making that structure, right? And if somebody else fixes it, I might look at that as, an, as criticism of me instead of an improvement in my model, right? So we need to fix that way of thinking in order for this whole thing to change. So I, want, I need to w feel that when you fix my structure, you have just made all this better and you've made, put more value into my structure and so I feel good too. That's how we have to have it, right? Um, there's some practical issues too. So if there's multiple, suppose that we, there was some way to have lots of interpretations of the same data. Well, you, the user, the biologist, well, which one should I look at? They're all kind of similar, but everyone is different, and I might get a different interpretation of the thing I'm actually interested in, depending on which one I look at. So how do I decide? Right? So that's a big issue, not totally solved, and um, that were, that, that's a really important one. And along with that, if I make a new structure, which one's, imp which one's better? How do you decide what's improved? A minor point is that the, the original positor, they might have s access to some specialized information that they didn't specify as metadata. And um, if so, um, maybe an automated re a repeat or my own repeat later might not do as well. So we need to keep that, that kind of thing in, in mind. Um, another reason this doesn't happen um, is because deposition is a big job. Okay, so if we're going to continuously improve structures, what might it look like? Well, it could be systematic optimization of all the structures. That's PDB redo, just continue that, make it better, great. Redetermination of groups of related structures, I talked about that, that, that kind of idea. Or redetermination of certain groups of structures where you're focusing on specific questions. Maybe you're going to look at just metal-containing proteins and look at all the bond lengths uh, that are in those and really refine every structure in order to obtain that information most accurately. So that would be a perfectly fine thing you might want to save and let other people have down the road. And um, so what do we have to do if we want to make this all happen? So we really need a way uh, to validate the data um, and have available to us uh, validated process data and metadata so that a person can, t can start now, starting off with the original structure perhaps, or maybe starting from scratch, and redo everything and have all the information that's necessary uh, that was also available to the original uh, depositor. 
So the PD, we talked here a lot about collecting me metadata, and this is just totally critical, right? Because you have to have a way to transfer the information that the original person had to a person later so that they can do the optimal job in, in, uh, in, in developing a new model. And I think it would really be ideal for the deposited data at deposition time, basically to one of the rep validation checks would be taking the deposited data, deposited metadata, and eventually just redoing the structure determination with those and validating that the answer you get is pretty much the same thing as the depositor got. Right? So today it's not very feasible, it takes too much computer time, blah, 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 but that won't be a limiting factor down the road. Right? So no particular reason why you couldn't do that. So that says, yes, at least using today's technology, we get pretty much the same thing they did. They, they must have deposited it, the right amount of metadata. If they didn't do that, then we wouldn't be able to get the answer and you just send it back to them and say, give us enough data so we can reproduce what you did. Right? Seems pretty obvious. You also need um, unmerged data. So we, uh, John Westbrook talked about this a little bit before. Um, it's really essential uh, to have unmerged data or the images themselves in order to do this validation process uh, well. So we haven't really talked about it so much today, but basically the estimation of errors in the intensities of reflections is not as uh, is difficult to do accurately. And particularly for, say, measuring anomalous differences and estimating the uncertainties in the anomalous differences that go into phasing and so forth, it's very hard to get those numbers right. The most powerful way of getting that number pretty accurate is to have multiple measurements of the same things. And in order to validate whether or not somebody did that correctly, you need all those multiple measurements of the same things, or you need the raw images so you can redo it from the beginning. So these things are totally critical. So the raw diffraction images that we're talking about today are by far the best way uh, to, to, to do this. Okay, so just a couple more slides here on, on what do we need to do to make this, this all happen. So if the original depositor's structure is not gonna be the only structure that the protein data bank or somebody else um, serves up, you have to have a way to decide which one to look at. And um, so I make a point here about the, the views, the, the protein data bank is, the protein data bank, um, RCSB, and Europe and Japan, there are three different portals and they actually give slightly different views of the same information. Um, the PDB, uh, the www.pdb.org uh, is by far the most hit, I think. And so whatever they put on their website, that's what a lot of people are gonna see. So which st structures they serve up and same thing for the other uh, uh, versions of the PDB, make, have a huge influence on what people are gonna think or what they're gonna do. And the model that's appropriate for a particular use may depend on what that use is. So I was just giving you some examples before. If, if, you're, if your use is what are the bond lengths um, for metal atoms to their ligands in, in proteins, um, then you want a certain way of having handled that data and a certain pruning of all the data in order to do that. On the other hand, if you're um, just interested in what's the overall shape of my molecule, then you don't care about those things um, nearly as much, right? And so eventually, it will be necessary to know what is in the user's mind, what do I want, what am I going to do with that structure, and then serve them up a structure that is most appropriate for that use. And there will pres presumably always be some default thing, um, which might be just, for example, the highest resolution structure um, analyzed most recently with the best statistics in some measure, right? So you, you might serve that up. And of course, the PDB would always also serve up the very original one if people want the original interpretation, which is always going to be there, right? And so how are we going to go about doing this? Um, so as I say, you need, we need a way to serve up the right model, and you have to have metrics for making those decisions. And so this is what many people are working on right now is the idea of you have a list of structures, a list of possible interpretations of the same data. How do you rank these different interpretations um, for different uses or just for validation? Uh, is this which structure is most likely to be closest to the right answer? Right? And there's no firm answer to any of these things. The PDB is working very hard on uh, developing tools for this validation though. And um, so in this slide, I'm illustrating some of the things that are happening along these lines. Um, so number one, uh, there's a lot of discussion now 
um, about the idea of versioning of structures in the PDB. Instead of having a new PDB deposit for a new interpretation of the same thing, there's just one data and one PDB identifier that goes with the data and then versions of that same thing. And those could be versions that would be the, new depo uh, the same depositor replacing it might be a version or somebody outside making a new version that might be a new, a new version, et cetera. So everybody's, the, it's just a conceptual thing. Now everybody, everything is associated with data and there are different interpretations of that data. So that makes more sense in terms of serving things up. And then validation, as I've been talking about, um, in the Protein Data Bank now, the, the PDB has task forces um, for each overall class of data, like x-ray data, EM data, and so forth. And for each one of these, the task forces have the responsibility of identifying criteria, um, numerical measures that can be used as criteria to identify it, are there problems or not problems with this structure. So the um, protein uh, or x-ray uh, validation task force um, went through that exercise a number of years ago, came up with a long list of uh, calculations to be made, uh, things such as bond lengths, clashes, uh, agreement with the density, et cetera, a long list of these things. And when you go to the PDB today, you can download um, by clicking a long sheet that lists the results of all those things. Now, one might say these, this, these, these reports need a little bit more work so that they, they're easier to interpret. That's just a minor technical aspect of it. The reports themselves are very, very valuable. And the PDB is continue, continuing to upgrade and update these, uh, these uh, validation uh, reports. And the basic idea is these validation reports will be available to users of the PDB. They'll be available, we hope, um, to reviewers always before um, uh, accepting uh, papers. And then down the road, the same inf information can be used for serving up the right uh, structure for each purpose. So I, that's where I think we're going to be going here, is we'll have metrics that say what are the uh, numerical criteria for how the quality of the structure in many different ways, um, and then use those as some mixture of those as a way to serve up the structure that's most appropriate for particular um, users. And um, we've been talking about images a lot, and I just want to mention that there's actually several places right now where people can deposit or have made their ORA images um, made available. And one is Vladek's uh, site that he talked about earlier uh, today, which is just super great, and it's really wonderful to see that. That's going to be a way to, to download um, images from any of a number of different places uh, and with a lot of analysis that goes with them. Also, the SB Grid, um, which is an organization that um, supplies crystallographic software, um, many different types of crystallographic software as a big package to many structural biology groups, all, and which also has access to um, cloud computing. Um, they also have a system for depositing a raw diffraction data for their users. So those users can also um, do that. So in summary, um, I think everything I said is perfectly obvious, and I'm really glad that today it's obvious, even if it wasn't a few years ago. And um, I think there's a really great future for continually up updating what's in the PDB, making the structures more and more accurate, making them more, more and more comprehensive, and serving up the right structures uh, to the right users. Thanks. The idea of versioning uh, of entries in the PDB is, uh, is a good idea, but it's almost a paradigm shift for the PDB because uh, I guess up to now the, the basic unit of the PDB has been the model, right? It's been the coordinates and uh, for the longest time uh, even uh, structure factors were not required, were not recorded. And uh, so what you're proposing is basically making the structure factor the basic unit of the PDB, which I think is a good idea and uh, will be very helpful. So can I respond to that one first? So the, the PDB uh, 
has been giving very positive indications that they really like this approach and would like to do something along these lines. So I'm anticipating this will happen and soon. Okay. Uh, and uh, so the second comment is uh, something going back to the whole metadata idea. You said that, uh, and everyone knows that I guess, with uh, more modern software, more modern approaches, you get uh, better models, better structures from the same data. And that, uh, I guess, flies in the face of the idea of the user during the time of the experiment making a decision of which metadata to record and which compression algorithm to use for his project. Because in the end, the whole long-term storage is not about this person's project, but again, it's more about the data themselves, right? So yes. how do you make this decision of what you want to record, how you want to compress for it to be useful down the road? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important question. I don't know the answer to that, of course. So the user at the time of collecting the data or at the time of deposition doesn't know what 10 years from now, 20, 50 years from now, somebody will want to do with that data. So the more accurately, the more comprehensively we can save the information that we do have about the data, um, the better off we'll be. Um, as I sort of maybe facetiously s said earlier, uh, today the, de the default is highly lossy compression, which is basically interpretation of the data and saving merged structure factors. That's the default, okay? And that's not so bad. We're doing pretty well, and that's way better than not having structure factors at all. So every incremental thing that we add beyond that is just a plus. And um, the more of those we have, the better off we'll be. And yeah, I can see somebody a long time from now having some idea about how to interpret all these things. And they'll go through the whole protein data banks of 10 million structures, and they'll re redo them all, analyzing something that we didn't ever thought about at all. And I think that would just be fantastic. Tom, do you, I think that you made extremely good point that we really do not know what we should do. Because in we are working in fast prototyping mode. How I know that it's 192 frame formats, at least 192, because I encounter 192, but somewhere there may be more. And the same we have with uh, structures and metadata. We do not, as long as we do not have even uh, basic metadata, uh, metadata set for all PDB, we, we really do not know what we can do with that. Yes, and to, or yes. with images. Agreed. So this is a repeat of a comment I made earlier, but outside of the session. Um, instead of worrying about the fact that there are so many different frame formats, why not make it part of the archiving process that everything gets transformed into the same frame format. Then it's just one place that has the same frame formats and you don't need to worry about it, right? Then the PDB has only CBF. I don't know, it doesn't have to be CBF, but the PDB only stores one type of frame and then everyone can reprocess it using whichever software they want. So you essentially turn the frame format problem over to the archivers. Yeah, so actually, I, I am personally totally in favor of this, this idea. Um, and my interpretation of that is that uh, the software developers like Vladek and company have a mechanism for taking 192 different whatevers um, and turning them into something internal that is one version. So uh, yeah, I'm looking for Vladek to answer this. And then presumably, that thing could be written out. Exactly. So and presumably that thing could be standardized because it's only five people doing it instead of 300 people doing it. And I think if that would be possible, it would be really fantastic. Yes. So I think that future proofs the, the problem at least a little bit. Um, and I had one second comment, which is really minor. Um, and that's if you're starting to talk about um, taking multiple versions of a file and then giving data to choose which one is the best one, do you then need to introduce a new phraseology. I mean, you've got data about data about data. Maybe that's not metadata, it's hyperdata. <laughs> uh, yeah, perhaps so. And, you know, better is, is the wrong word to be using for sure. 
Yes, yes but obviously, internally we have our own frame format. Yes. Yes, otherwise we would went crazy long time ago. I mean, I'm, I am crazy, I realize that, but <laughs> that's crazy. Yes. Uh, but, uh, and we have a procedure to write in that format. Unfortunately, it's not so easy, yes, to, to write, because it's relatively easy to change the goniostat outside if you are learning after sometime that this goniostat is not accurate. You would have to rewrite all this data. Yes, you would have to rewrite all this. I data. see. So your your interpretation, your your internal data is actually interpreted data that yes. depends upon parameters, which may or On may not be. On all parameters which not, are so in dev side. So it's a little yes. far from the original, which which is a bit. You don't think it's risky? It sounds risky to me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you see that it's even more complicated because, look, we are getting data from, let's say, beamline A. Yes, and we are doing, and they usually, they send one data set, they are saying it's extremely urgent because users are coming tomorrow, we have to have something. We are doing that, we are giving them, three months later we are learning that it's really not the one frame format, there are two frame formats. Yes, and already some people use this other frame format. Yes, I mean, you see that as an example of the company which does not exist uh, as a valid company is ADSC detector, extremely good detector, which had software binning and hardware binning. And companies, they do not know which one is better. So they are saying, okay, we will leave that to users. But they are not say, saying anything about Yes, we are getting data, and error density, so-called error density parameter, is different for these two. It's deeper, different by the factor of five. And overnight, you are learning that some people who use, let's say, software binning, when you got hardware binning, they have worse resolution than they obtained before. So these are the problems which we have I mean, we, the people who develop software, processing software in real life. So can I uh, propose an alternative version? Um, so still, a user who takes your software um, and produces intensities out of it, you and the user have gone through a process there with a the little handshake that says you understand their inputs um, and are able to interpret those inputs in terms of parameters that you need, namely all the angles, all the geometry, whatever, could you not write out that information, which I think you were doing, uh, that information which is sufficient to reproduce the experiment, the analysis with your software, and also with another, you're writing it out so that XDS or somebody else can also do that. that, that is, that's halfway there, and it seems like that, depositing that would be very, very beneficial. Mike Wall. Uh, right, Mike Wall, Los Alamos. Um, so uh, the question I have has more to do with my perspective um, viewing the protein structure as an ensemble rather than a single structure. So in a kind of Bayesian way, you can define a likelihood for different models depending on the data. And uh, some models more likely than others. So the approach that you described um, seems fine of reporting one structure to a user assuming that this likelihood function is very sharp. But if it is um, uh, broader, then it might be good to actually force a user to pay attention to multiple models and instead of presenting one, especially uh, if what they're going to do with it will yield a different answer depending on like which one they choose. So what you described is like a huge advance over the way things are now. What I'm describing is something that I guess would go somehow beyond that, so how far are we from yeah. doing this next step? So Mike, I, I totally agree. I didn't talk about that today, but actually that is an issue that I, I feel is very, very important. Um, that basically 
we shouldn't be representing these st these structures as a single structure as one uh, as in the beginning. That that's wrong. It, it's not what's in the crystal. The crystal has millions of structures in it, um, and some representation of what those structures are is where we have to eventually go. And so I totally agree with your point. So I'd like to um, also consider the end point here. So we have the better process, the continual improvement. So we get to this better uh, use of the data through the communal efforts. So now to pose the well-rehearsed question on behalf of Derwood Cruikshank, who passed away a few years ago, whose first paper on understanding the precision of coordinates in crystal structures was 1949. So in looking at what we do, he was very concerned, and it's perhaps more the matter of the graphics representation software that we all use of having a uniform view of the precision of non-bonded distances two decimal places um, and he said that just cannot be true just look at the B factors if two atoms are you know potentially interacting and they're 80 angstrom square then looking at integer precision of their distances apart let alone two decimal places so we have our half a billion downloads per year um, of the fruits of our research. And these are not specialists in our techniques, and they go away with a false precision. So he thinks, and I agree with him, forced to agree with him, he had me on the ropes, this is a big issue for our field, and maybe it's solvable by education, and all that the PDB is doing like we heard, uh, we saw a precision on a wavelength to seven decimal places this morning. Um, and it's just the over-enthusiastic computer scientists providing all of these columns for our uh, experimental parameters and our results. But there is an issue here. I think he's right. Yes, it's an ensemble of structures because we have millions and millions in our, in our sample. But that variation, let's perhaps avoid the word coordinate error, but coordinate variation tells us that we have to provide to non-expert users a much better feel for what the atom placement yes. precision is. Yes. So I, once again, totally agree with this. Uh, so actually, let me make, make a little point here. Uh, we need to differentiate between two types of um, imprecision or in uncertainty. One is, in the actual crystal, there's millions and millions of different protein molecules, or whatever they are. And everyone is a little bit different, right? And so that's describing what's actually in the crystal. And also, these are not necessarily just Gaussian distributions that are represented simply by nice little B factors. Um, they may be static disorder, maybe may many different things that can be going on. So what's in the crystal is fairly complicated and is not well represented by a single model. It's, it would be better represented by a single model plus some numbers that say what the uncertain, what the variation is. That would be a, a better step, which we aren't even doing. Um, so that would be the first order improvement would be what's the variability in the crystal for those numbers, right? And then second order would be um, something about what are the different conformational um, ensembles that describe most of the variation or something like that, right? So that's where Mike's going to. Uh, so that's one thing, but separate issue is we're using our crystallographic tools to try to describe the structure, um, and we come up with models, and there's some, uh, if we did the same experiment twice, we'd come up with different models. And how much do those vary? And so surely that second variation um, is a lower bound um, on our uncertainty of what is in the crystal, what is in the crystal itself, right? So the crystal varies, and we don't even know what's in the crystal. So we need to describe both of those things, and um, I think ultimately we're going to describe both of those by some way of talking about ensembles of structures. And it may be molecular dynamic simulations that kind of give us a handle on how to describe that. Um, it may be we have a limited number of ensembles that describe most of the variability, and that's what we're going to report. But absolutely, the, the end user has to understand what they can know from what we're telling them and what they can't know. 
and right today, you give them a single structure and they look at the distance between two atoms and they think these things must be hydrogen bonded because they're, you know, the right distance apart. But maybe it's that way only one thousandth of the time and most of the time there's some other completely different configuration, right? And we're not telling them that today. We're not even telling them. It's ridiculous. So I totally agree. I hope the Commission on Biological Macromolecules will take this up under your leadership. Great. So again, it's just another comment. You said if you take two crystals and do the diffraction experiment, you get two different models. If you take the same crystal and the same data and process it in two different ways, you get two different models. Yes. So it's even worse than two different crystals. Yes, yeah, yes, absolutely true, absolutely true. Actually, the good thing is, so we, we studied this a little bit a few years ago with just macromolecular structures and just reinterpreting the exact same crystal data, uh, just running it, running it through our software a bunch of times with different random seeds. And the good thing is, like in a macromolecule, the core of the molecule, they just superimpose like extremely closely. You just can't do any, you can't interpret these structures any other way other than to basically put these atoms in pretty much the same places. But the stuff on the surface varies a huge, huge amount, yes. Thank you very, very much indeed, Tom, and I'm sure everybody wants to show the usual appreciation. Thank you very, very much. So, Brian will reconfirm the logistics, which is seven o'clock minibus outside the front, and uh, enjoy, I don't know, an hour and a half in the pool or whatever takes your fancy. Thank you. <laughs>